It turns out that when you study, even superficially, the history of various ancient cultures, you can find throughout history evidence of aerial objects that were unidentified dating all the way back to the beginning of written history. The ancient Mesopotamians, the ancient Egyptians, the uh, ancient Indians, the Hindu uh, religion, ancient Japan, the Americas, and many, many other cultures spoke about flying chariots, celestial cars, winged disks, luminous cloud ships, and glowing apparitions throughout history that terrified mankind. They indeed have affected all the continents over the history of recorded history. When we look at the ancient folklore, as many have done, Jacques Vallée, in his book, Passport to Magonia, Jacques Vallée, by the way, is the French, uh, he's an uh, astronomer and a mathematician from France. He was portrayed in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a uh, very scientific guy. He wrote a, um, a book called Passport to Magonia, first in 1969 and then revised it in 1993. And he examined all of the folklore uh, worldwide and stated that the folklore of every culture, it turned out, had a rich reservoir of stories of humanoid beings that flew in the sky, used devices that seemed in, in advance of the technology of the time. Another gentleman by the name of I.D.E. Thomas, who's a Christian uh, pastor, he wrote a book called The Omega Conspiracy in 1986. And in his book, he also documented extensively the existence of uh, unidentified flying objects that have affected mankind through history. And he said this, speaking about a document that was part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Genesis Apocryphon, it was called. He said, the copy of the Genesis Apocryphon discovered, discovered at Qumran, which is one of the, the, the other name for the Dead Sea, that's the, the uh, Qumran area in the Dead Sea. The, the Apocryphon discovered at uh, Qumran dates back to the second century BC. He says, when scholars finally made, made public its contents, the document confirmed that celestial beings from the skies had landed on planet Earth. More than that, it told how these beings had mated with the Earth women and had begat giants. Two other Christians, John Weldon and Zola Levitt, wrote a book in 1975 called UFOs, What on Earth is Happening? And on page 21, they said this, UFOs seem to have been around for a long time. We can find odd references to circles of fire in the sky in many historical documents and even in cave paintings. While we seem to be experiencing a great upsurge in reported sightings in our own day, every age seems to have had similar stories. From the mythology of ancient Assyria, we see a lot of inscriptions and reliefs on stone that depicted what they believed were flying gods in ancient time. From the mythology of ancient Assyria, approximately in the 8th 8th century BC, we find the story of Asher, the winged god of war. This ancient deity is typically represented as a humanoid form with a bow in hand and adjacent to a winged disc. There's the actual, um, oh, this, I'm sorry, this is a different one. Uh, according to many scholars, Asher was an adaptation of this uh, ancient uh, flying deity called Ahura Mazda, who was embraced by the prophet Zo Zoroaster in the 6th century BC. In this stone relief, we can see a um, uh, supposed flying god with what is supposed to be a disc with wings. It's interesting, when you look at the ancient cultures, you find a lot of these types of inscriptions of uh, humanoid type deities that were depicted as being flying deities with uh, often with discs or with other types of uh, craft. Sometimes uh, some of the ancient Hindu stuff shows what look like small, almost flying vehicles, flying cars. This is a color version of the ancient god Ahura Mazda. When we look at the myths and the legends of ancient Egypt, we also find an abundance of stories about flying deities who flew with winged discs, flying chariots, and the like. 
Many, including several Christian scholars, have interpreted these sightings as being probably ancient UFOs. According to Egyptian mythology, the sun god known as Ra is lord of the universe and flew in what they thought was a celestial boat. He is usually depicted, Ra the sun god is usually depicted with a human body with the head of a hawk. Horus was the descendant of Ra and the son of Isis, the nature goddess, and Horus was the god of the sky of light and of goodness, according to Egyptian mythology. Horus was usually depicted as a falcon or as a falcon-headed man. And according to Egyptian mythology, Horus was one of the gods who flew on the winged disk of Ra, which shined with many colors. In the hieroglyphs in the temple at Edfu, we read an inscription about Horus. It says, so Horus, the winged measurer, flew up towards the horizon in the winged disk of Ra. Then Horus, the winged measurer, reappeared in the winged disk, which shined with many colors. And he came back to the boat of Ra, the falcon of the horizon. And Thoth, and Thoth said, O Lord of the gods, the winged measurer has returned in the great winged disk, shining with many colors. So it's a pretty fascinating description. Flying disks in ancient Egypt. We have supposedly flying disks today. Now, we don't interpret them as gods. We make t-shirts and pins and uh, posters and uh, write books about these uh, alien entities. But the ancients believed, if indeed this is what was visiting in ancient times, believed that they were gods and worshiped them. We could go to the ancient Hindu mythology. In an ancient Hindu text called the Rig Veda, which was approximately 1300 to 1000 BC, we read of flying lightning cars, which were flown by flying gods of ancient times. It says, the valiant god car, his, the valiant god, his car ascends, swept by his fervid bounding speeds, athwart the sky the hero speeds. On flashing lightning cars they ride and gleam in warlike pomp and pride. The lions roar their voice of doom, with iron force their teeth consume. The hills, the earth itself, they shake all creatures at their coming quake. And also in the epic of ancient, Indi uh, ancient India, the Mahabharata, it says that the gods in cloud-borne chariots came into view the scene so far. Bright celestial cars in concourse sailed upon the cloudless sky. Or we could go to the legends of the ancient Incas, Aztecs and the Mayas, as well as the North American Indians. There are legends of ancient star beings who visited planet, planet Earth in ancient times from the star system Pleiades. In an article entitled ETs from the Pleiades by Robert Stanley in Unicus Magazine, Volume 4, 1995, page 26 and 27, he states this, he states, he states, religious legends of the pre-Inca people state that the universe was inhabited by gods and celestial beings who arrived on earth from the Pleiades. In Bolivia, near Lake Titicaca, are the ruins of the megalithic city of Tiahuanaco. Many of the city walls were constructed from blocks that weigh 60 tons, which were further reinforced by metal clamps. Legends relate how it was built in one night by mysterious bearded white men who were giants from Taurus, the constellation of the Pleiades. They also believe that to, they, are, they are also believed to have descended from the clouds and to have had sexual intercourse with Incan women. Now Chuck spoke about Genesis chapter six, about how the sons of God saw the daughters of men and came down, and these were fallen angels, and they interacted with and apparently even interbred with mankind and produce supernatural offspring. And what we see when we look at the legends of planet Earth is the same story, that beings from the heavens in our ancient past visited planet Earth, interacted with, according to some legends, helped build the pyramids, and produced supernatural, interbred with mankind and produced supernatural offspring. The ancients, of course, worshiped them as gods. In the city of Teo, Teo Tiwakan, a Mexican archaeological site about 25 miles northeast of Mexico City, are the remains of the earliest city in the Western Hemisphere. Among its monuments are the Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramid of the Moon, and the Avenue of the Dead. 
The exact period of its, extra, of its construction is not known. The majority of scholars believe that it flourished around 200 BC, and some believe it may have been built as early as 4000 BC. When the, Az when the Aztecs arrived in the 12th century AD, the city, of, the city was already in uh, ruins. The identity of the builders, builders of this city, uh, the largest pre-Columbian era, the largest city in the pre-Columbian era is a complete mystery to this day. However, there's a fascinating legend passed down from BC times, from before the time of Christ, which asserts that the city and its massive pyramids were built by giants. And indeed, the notion that the great monuments on planet Earth was built by giants is found throughout the mythology. Now we know, of course, in the Bible, it says there were giants in the land in those days and also after that, as Chuck spoke about. So that's some of the ancient, uh, some of the ancient stories about beings from the heavens visiting planet Earth and interacting with, interbreeding with, and assisting mankind in the past. Eric Von Donegan in his book, Gods from Outer Space in 1972, summarized the history of planet Earth in this time. He said this, Ancient Sumerian records tell of gods descending from the stars and fertilizing their ancestors. This interbreeding of gods from heaven and women from earth is supposed to have produced the first men upon the earth. The native inhabitants of Malakula in the New Hebrides believed that the first race of men were direct descendants of the sons of heaven. From India comes the Mahabharata and other ancient Sanskrit texts which tell of gods begetting children with women of earth and how these children inherited the supernatural skills and learning of their fathers. A similar mythology is found in the epic of Gilgamesh where we read of watchers from outer space coming to planet earth and producing giants. An early Persian myth tells that before the coming of Zoroaster, demons had corrupted the earth and allied themselves with women. So the story that we see in the Bible of these sons of God visiting planet Earth and interacting with and interbreeding with mankind is something which is also echoed in the legends of mankind's history. In a recent book called Alien Agenda, written in 1997 by Jim Mars, on page 55, Jim Mars spoke about this common thread as well. He says, as the similarities, similarities of widely spread cultures continue to be appreciated, a pattern of common worldwide connections is emerging. Egyptian legends tell of the Tep Zepi, or the first time, an age when sky gods came down to earth, raised the land up from under the mud and water, flew through the air in flying boats. It is intriguing to note that these ancient gods displayed very human attributes. They required food and clothing. They liked to imbibe wine and were not above consorting with comely young ladies. Alien Agenda, page 55. So the ancient evidence shows many ancient cultures recorded visitations of beings from the heavens. Often these beings are described as flying on a variety of craft. They interacted with, helped, and even interbred with mankind, and they produced offspring that were supernatural, often described as giants. Okay, let's come to the modern era. Of course, we're in here in Roswell, New Mexico in 1997 to talk about UFOs on the 50th anniversary of what was believed to be a UFO crash here in Roswell. Well, it turns out that the modern era of UFOs actually began a couple of weeks earlier. On June 24th, 1947, Kenneth Arnold sighted fly, fly, or nine flying saucers near Yakima, Washington. It was widely reported in the press. Arnold was ridiculed extensively by uh, people in the media, and ultimately he said after the experience that he would not report a flying 10-story building if he saw it, <laughs> because he was ridiculed by so many people. And of course, in July 1947, something crashed in Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, I have no idea what it was. Does anybody out here? <laughs> but the key thing about Roswell was that it began really the era of the government cover-up. If it was just a balloon, why were there bodies? And why was there a huge government cover-up that persists to this day? 
It's interesting that the recent story that the government has come out with, the notion that they were dummies thrown from a balloon, which didn't start till 1953, but uh, the cover story was created to explain away the existence of bodies and of some type of a craft. So whatever crashed in Roswell in 1947, the important point was that it began an era of intense government cover-up of the whole UFO phenomenon. But the really big event around that time occurred in Washington, D.C. in July 1953. On July 19th, 19, I'm sorry, it's 19th, yes, 1953. On July 19th, 1953 in Washington, D.C., at 11.40 p.m., seven UFOs were picked up on the long-range radar at the air route traffic control used for air traffic around Washington, D.C. The objects were also picked up by radar at the Washington National Airport. The encounter was fully documented by Edward Ruppelt, the former director of Project Blue Book. Shortly after detection, two of the objects streaked away at approximately 7,000 miles per hour, a speed completely impossible for craft at that time. The air traffic controllers at both sites confirmed not only the existence of the UFOs, but their rapid disappearance as well. Several times throughout the night, commercial pilots confirmed the targets as unusual lights. The following weekend on July 26 at 10.30 p.m., controllers at the Washington National Airport detected slow-moving UFOs traveling towards Andrews Air Force Base. One hour later at approximately 11.30 p.m., officials at the nearby Newcastle County Air Force Base in Delaware dispatched two F-94 jet interceptors. Visual and radar contact was made, and the story was big news in Washington, D.C., but ultimately they did not identify the nature of these craft. The Washington Times Herald in July 19, I'm sorry, in uh, June, uh, no, sorry, July 20th, 1953, the headline says, Jets alerted for saucers. Interceptors chase lights in D.C. skies. In the Washington Post, fiery objects outrun jets over the Capitol. In the Evening Star, experts push studies as objects in skies are reported again. Air Force experts, the subtitle says, continue their investigation. So obviously something really big happened, and they never explained it. It was quietly ignored and covered up by the government. Although they did have a press conference, there was a press conference that was held initially, and they tried to explain away the Washington lights, these UFOs that were disc-like craft traveling 7,000 miles an hour. They tried to explain them away as a weather phenomenon. Only problem is there aren't any clouds that I know of that can travel 7,000 miles an hour. <laughs> People that were in the control room, however, did report that indeed the uh, signals sent back by the radar equipment could not have been uh, due to a weather inversion or clouds or storms or anything. In 1961, the Brookings Institute gave a report on a study that was commissioned by NASA earlier, a couple of years earlier. The Brookings Institute was asked by NASA to examine the effect of the discovery of extraterrestrial entities, intelligent extraterrestrial life in the universe. And the Brookings Institute, looking at the makeup of America at that time, came back with their recommendation in 1961 stating that if NASA discovered evidence of highly evolved extraterrestrials anywhere, they should not release the information because they said it would cause the collapse of society. People would freak, basically, is what they said. I'm just hitting the highlights of some of the current events. One of the best documented events in the history probably the best documented UFO event in history, started in Mexico City on July 11th, 1991. This was the day that the total eclipse of the sun occurred over central Mexico. On that day, 17 individuals, independently in several different cities, videotaped and or photographed UFOs below the blacked out sun. Most of the people didn't realize they saw it until after they played their tapes back. The tapes had been widely broadcast in Mexico on the media. The Mexican equivalent of 60 minutes, called 60 minutos, 
catchy name. Did stories on the events and have continued to do some stories. Jaime Masson, who is the, uh, was the producer and director, one of the producers and directors of 60 Minutes, has done a number of stories on the UFOs over Mexico City. The really big event in Mexico City occurred in January, on January 1st of 1993. New Year's Day at high noon, starting at about 2.51 in the afternoon and ending at 6 p.m. in the afternoon, a series of three to four silvery UFOs were photographed, videotaped, over the skies of Mexico City. I believe Mexico City is the biggest city in the world, is it not? Population-wise, I believe it is. Midday, daylight discs, floating and dancing, doing aerial acrobatics over the city. Television stations interrupted regular programming to show the event. People exited their cars on the main street in Mexico City and stood and stared at the objects. The newspapers reported the next day headlines with photographs of people standing in the streets looking at the UFOs, people exiting their cars, uh, policemen, uh, military personnel, exiting their cars, standing there staring at silvery disks which hovered over the central portion of Mexico City on January 1st, 1993. And yet, did we hear about it here in this country? No, not a thing. Absolute silence. It was covered by radio stations and television stations for days. It was the talk of the town. In fact, people state that UFO sightings have become so common in Mexico that the people yawned. I mean, it's like, oh, another UFO. You know, pass the burrito, honey, you know. <clears throat> you know. People are not impressed anymore, you know. Honey, did you see the alien beam ship hover, hovering over the backyard? Yeah, I did. You know, no big deal. You know. So UFOs have been incredibly prominent in the skies over Mexico City. Videotaped by dozens and dozens of people that day. Videotaped by television stations who even, as I mentioned, interrupted their events that day. How, how's that for a... Uh... <laughs> Oy vey! <laughs> in Spanish, right? <laughs> the event lasted approximately four to five hours, and yet was not reported in the United States, except on sort of the alternate media sources. We could go to the testimony of the astronauts. It turns out that there are 13 astronauts at least who have publicly stated or have written that they believe and or have seen UFOs. One of them, Ed Mitchell, in April 1996, was interviewed on Dateline NBC. He stated that he believed in UFOs, and he believed that the US government covered up the Roswell incident. In the interview, he said, I have no firsthand experience but I have, an, I have had an, the opportunity to meet with people from three countries who, in the course of their official duties, claim to have had personal, first-hand encounter experiences with extraterrestrials. I'm convinced there's life throughout the universe. It's just a question of how developed. Gordon Cooper, also a very famous astronaut, met with United, United Nations officials in 1978 in a subcommittee. He wrote a letter to the United Nations stating that he believed that UFOs were real, and he encouraged them to fund research into the topic because he felt it was potentially a threat to the country. Brian O'Leary, who was one of the astronauts that was scheduled to be in the Mars mission, ultimately that was canceled. He also has written extensively about his beliefs on UFOs and John Blaha as well. In fact, John Blaha, who was the commander of the space shuttle Discovery on March 24, 1989, was picked up on a secret ham radio channel, and I believe this is on Chuck's tape, Return of the Nephilim, and on the uh, audio set that I have as well. It states, he stated, after seeing something, Houston, this is Discovery. We still have the alien spacecraft under 
observance. Now, NASA, of course, when this got out, said, well, he wasn't talking about you know, a UFO. He was talking about the Russian space station or something like that. But they don't call the Russian space station an alien vessel, okay? an alien spacecraft. So the, they deny that he was speaking about a UFO. But indeed, many NASA astronauts have, have seen UFOs. In June 1996, the Japanese government announced that they were going to fund a UFO museum with what they said were artifacts of UFOs. And of course, on August 6, 1996, NASA announced that there is evidence of extraterrestrial life, microscopic extraterrestrial life on the planet Mars, which was found, they claim, in a meteorite. In the last year, there's been a lot of activity that has uh, happened with regards to that meteorite story. In fact, uh, many, many places, University of California, San Diego, University of Hawaii, and others have stated that the evidence that they found is insignificant and does not indicate evidence of life. It was probably a contamination. The debate continues, though, today. Of course, it was big news in the papers. Many people stated that it was the greatest discovery of the 20th century, or maybe in history. Others stated that the discovery of extraterrestrial life on planet Earth was a tremendous threat to our Christian worldview. And I heard people stating things like, if life is discovered elsewhere, it's going to pose a tremendous uh, challenge to the Christian faith. Now let's talk about some of the recent prominent sightings. One of the recent sightings started in Israel was in 1996 in September. At 2 a.m. on Tuesday, September 17th, 1996, traffic on the high road at Ramat Aviv, section of Tel Aviv, became at a standstill when motorists exited their vehicles to watch a UFO hovering near Tel Aviv. Photographs were taken, people were interviewed, and more and more events occurred uh, in the subsequent weeks um, regarding the um, uh, UFO sightings. Still today, if you monitor, the, monitor this news, you still get occasional sightings. One of the sightings, which was in the southern part of Israel near the Egyptian border, 5,000 people supposedly witnessed a uh, late uh, evening UFO sighting over Israel. Israeli journey, journalist Iris Almagor, writing in the European periodical UFO Reality in March 1997, wrote an article of this, stated that a wave of unprecedented appearances of UFOs in the skies of Israel has stirred up UFO enthusiasts and several thousands of other people who have been witnesses to unforgettable sights. The mounting reports in recent weeks leave no room for doubt in the minds of many that UFOs have invaded planet Earth. And they call the, the media in Israel calls the Israel events the, uh, the big invasion. Then on November 23, 1996, CNN and Reuters and many other uh, news services reported a huge cigar-shaped UFO that was televised in Korea for 10 minutes. The event was recovered, was, uh, the event was um, covered uh, extensively in the international and even in the American press, which was quite a surprise to most people. In December 1996, scientists from Creighton University reported an object that they filmed that they claimed was traveling one one hundredth the speed of light at an altitude of 80 kilometers. One one hundredth the speed of light. That's 1,860 miles per second. It was filmed by these people at the University of Creighton, and it was ob the object on film was found to make a 90 degree turn, leading them to state that the object must be, must be massless, because nothing that was a physical object could do such a maneuver. It was reported in the uh, news, again on CNN and many of the American uh, press, uh, this is a web page from uh, December 17th, 1996, you can see uh, your friend there, St. Nick, you know, say this is the uh, CNN uh, webpage. And of course, recently, in 1997, March 13th, we had the Phoenix sighting. 
According to witnesses in Phoenix, a triangular craft described as a, described as a delta craft with seven lights on the leading edge was spotted in central Arizona and traveled slowly through the state. Some described it as about a mile wide, between three football fields and up to a mile wide. Some said that it looked like a solid object, and others stated that they thought that they could see partially through the object. It was reported fairly extensively in the Phoenix media, but it wasn't until June 18th and 19th, 1997, that the event got widespread coverage in the uh, national press. On the morning of June 18th, 1997, Richard Price, a writer for USA Today, wrote an article which was on the front page of USA Today about the event. And he said this, something happened in the skies over Arizona on the night of March 13th. No one is sure what it was, but thousands saw it, dozens videotaped it, and people all over the state are still haunted by it. Witnesses generally agree on three things. First, it was enormous. The most conservative estimate describes it as three football fields long. Computer analysis of the tapes put it at 6,000 feet or more than a mile. Second, it, was, it made no sound. And third, it moved slowly over Phoenix, cruising at 30 miles per hour. Several times it hovered in place in the sky. According to local witnesses and according to the article itself, Three F-16s were scrambled from the nearby Luke Air Force Base to go after the UFO. But when the F-16s approached, it immediately vanished, making a maneuver that no physical craft could do, according to the eyewitnesses. On June 19, 97, witnesses were interviewed on CBS Morning News. And one of the gentlemen described this craft they asked him what he thought about UFOs. He said, I was skeptical before I saw this. Afterwards, he said that he believed that it was an alien visitation craft that was interdimensional. He said, based on the behavior of this Phoenix sighting, he thought that it was some sort of a craft from beyond our space-time domain, an interdimensional or, in effect, a supernatural entity. So we've seen the history of UFOs, we've seen some of the recent and some of the ancient descriptions of UFOs. Now let's talk about the physical evidence. The physical evidence for UFOs has been studied ex extensively by uh, many scientists. I.D.E. E. Thomas, again a Christian, writing in his book The Omega Conspiracy on page 201, summarized this. He said of UFOs, these space vehicles have been tracked on radar, fired on by jet fighter planes, photographed a hundred times, and have left indisputable indisputable evidence of their landing on the ground. In all, 15 million Americans, including a former president of the United States, claim to have seen them. The evidence is such that Marcia Seligson could write in the New West magazine that there is an accumulation of material weighty enough to bury the toughest skeptic. This is from 1996. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, was the chairman of the Department of Astronomy at, New, at uh, Northwestern University. Dr. Hynek was a skeptic, a non-believer in UFOs back in about 1953 when he was commissioned by Project Blue Book to be their chief scientific officer. And he said in his book, The UFO Experience, A Scientific Inquiry in 1972, when I first got involved in this field, I was particularly skeptical of people who said they had seen UFOs on several occasions and totally incredulous about those who claimed to have been taken aboard one, but I've had to change my mind. In the Newsweek magazine on November 21st, 1997, he stated, it is no longer possible to sweep away the whole subject. It reminds me of the days of Galileo when he was trying to get people to look at the sunspots. They would say that the sun is a symbol of God. God is perfect, therefore, uh, God is perfect. Therefore, spots cannot exist. Therefore, there is no point in looking. And this is the way many people are. In fact, I find that a lot of Christians don't want to deal with this subject because it is a disturbing subject. They would just prefer to use the ostrich technique, dig a hole, stick the head in, pull the dirt in on you, and hope that they go away, and that they don't bother us. But many people that have studied it, and I'm not talking about, you know, um, Strange, weird people running around with Spock ears, you know, doing a Klingon handshake, saying, may the force be with you, okay? I'm talking about scientists 
very well-educated scientists have studied it extensively and have, de have indeed concluded that UFOs are indeed a real phenomenon. Now, during the 40s and 50s, the majority of people believed that UFOs were simply nuts and bolts craft from another planet, another star system. That was the prevailing view. But in the last couple of decades, the scientists that have taken a real serious look at the UFO phenomenon have come to a rather startling conclusion. They have noticed that UFOs behave in ways that cannot be explained if these were physical ships. For example, many UFOs have been noted to materialize and dematerialize before people's eyes. They're there, and then they're gone. It's not a matter of flying away, it's a matter of dematerializing or materializing directly in front of people. They've also been no noted to morph or to change shape directly in front of witnesses. Many UFOs have been clocked at over 20,000 miles per hour. Now the space shuttle, when it lands, it comes in at about 17,000 miles an hour and it starts to burn up. That's why they have to put tiles on the bottom because the friction is so intense that it causes physical objects to burn up and yet UFOs are able to travel at incredible speeds according to being clocked on radar and other methods and yet they do not burn up, indicating to many that they are not physical objects. Many have also been seen to perform right angle turns at speeds of up to 15,000 miles an hour. Now let's say you and I this afternoon get in your car and we get it up to 15,000 mi miles an hour, okay? And then you decide to make a 90 degree right angle turn, okay? You and I are gonna become subatomic particles, okay? <laughs> you will not be able to recognize, there will not even, I mean dental charts won't even help. And yet UFOs have been seen to travel at those types of speeds and make right angle turns. They also do not cause sonic booms, which is also something that you would not expect for a physical object. And they also have make incredibly quick starts and stops, also impossible for physical objects. If you and I were traveling 65 miles an hour and we made a stop, went from 65 to zero in say, three feet, we would be dead. I mean, we'd be recognizable, dental charts might be helpful, but we'd be dead. And yet UFOs make extremely fast starts and stops impossible for physical objects. Also, UFOs have been seen to break up into multiple UFOs or multiple UFOs have been seen which can merge into a single object. Now, this behavior has disturbed a number, of, a number of scientists, and they've commented on it extensively in the last 20 years. Physicist James Campbell, writing in SCP Journal, 1977, page 14, stated that evidence left at landing sites leaves little room that UFOs are heavy, ponderous objects when addressed. Yet, in flight, their startling departures, sudden stops, and right angle turns at high speed require them to be virtually massless because a physical object could not do these things. John Keel, another gentleman that's been researching UFOs for about four decades, wrote a book called Operation Trojan Horse in 1973. And on page 182, he said this, the statistical data which I have extricated indicate that flying saucers are not stable machines requiring fuel, maintenance, or logistical support. They are in all probability transmogrifications of energy and do not exist in the same way that this book exists. They are not permanent constructions of matter. Transmogrification is something which is able to change its shape, transmogrify. That's John Keel. Jacques Vallée in 1988 wrote a book called Dimensions and on page 231 and 232, he stated this. He had just listed in his book a number of sightings that betrayed um, behavior of uh, unusual behavior, the unusual physics of UFOs, and he said this. Considering, consider what these sightings have in common. In each case, the so-called spacecraft did not disappear by moving away, even at high speed. It simply vanished on the spot, or it slowly faded away like a Cheshire cat sometimes leaving behind a whitish cloud. Sometimes also producing a sound of an explosion. 
In other cases, UFOs have been reported to enter the ground. I hardly need to point out that this behavior is contrary to what physical objects do and quite impossible to duplicate with our current spacecraft technology. Jacques Vallée in 1988. Physicist Jacques, Jacques Lemaitre, writing in Flying Saucer Review, volume 15, on page 23, also talked about the unusual physics of UFOs. He said, we can consequently conclude that it is impossible to interpret the UFO phenomenon in terms of material spaceships as we conceive of the latter. That is, in terms of manufactured, self-propelled machines retaining their material nature and their mechanical structure to travel from one solar system to another by, trans by traversing the distance separating these systems in the Einsteinian continuum. He means space. In other words, these are not physical craft coming here from another planet somewhere. They are behaving like supernatural or interdimensional phenomenon. J. Allen Hynek, again the head of astronomy at Northwestern University, wrote a book called UFO Report, August 1976. I'm sorry, no, this is a, a periodical UFO report, August 1976. And he said this, speaking about the superphysics of UFOs. He said, another peculiarity is the alleged ability of certain UFOs to dematerialize. There are quite a few reports, reported in, instances where two distinctly different UFOs hovering in clear sky, sky will converge and eventually merge into one object. So he's speaking about the ability, their ability to merge and their ability to materialize and dematerialize. Now, J. Allen Hynek, again, was a skeptic. He did not believe in UFOs. He thought they were the realm of the lunatic fringe when he started studying this phenomenon. This quote has already been there. And Jacques Vallée sums it up in his book, Dimensions, in 1988, on page 252 and 253. He asks this question. If they are not spacecraft, what else could UFOs be? What research framework can account for the physical effects, for the impact on society, for the appearance of the occupants, and for the seemingly absurd dreamlike elements of their behavior? How can we explain that the phenomenon makes itself obvious in rural populations, but avoids overt contact, choosing instead to deliver its message in bizarre abductions in highly strange incidents? The theory that suggests itself as we analyze and reanalyze the forces at play goes beyond the notion that these are simply technological vehicle, vehicles produced by an advanced race on another planet. Instead, I believe that the UFO phenomenon represents evidence for other dimensions beyond space-time. The UFOs may not come from ordinary space, but from a multiverse which is around us uh, which is all around us, and of which we have stubbornly refused to consider the disturbing reality in spite of the evidence available to us for centuries. Such a theory is, requi is required in order to explain both the modern cases and the Chronicles of Magonia. The Chronicles of Magonia is the stories of all of these things that occurred in ancient history that he recorded in his book, uh, Passport to Magonia. He says the abductions and the psychic component. He says that such a theory is required uh, in order to explain both the modern cases and the Chronicles of Magonia, the abductions and the psychic component. I believe that there is a system around us that transcends time and it transcends space. Other researchers have reached the same conclusion. Now, Valet has not been well received by a lot of scientists because Valet and the men like him who've come to this conclusion are opening up the very disturbing possibility that UFOs and their occupants, occupants are not from another planet, but they are from another dimension. And that option opens up the possibility that may, we may be dealing with a spiritual, possibly demonic realm as opposed to simple aliens from another planet. Gordon Creighton, the director of the Flying Saucer Review publication, a British publication, wrote a position statement in 1996. He said this, there seems to be no evidence yet that any of these craft or beings originate from outer space. 
The whole phenomenon involves a mass of features that conflict with modern science, and many researchers now believe that more than one type of being may be involved, some of them originating from outer space and some of them from an interdimensional nature and consequently possibly from some, from some unknown aspect of our own world. In other words, they may be among us, there may be, they may, they, may, they may be among us, but we may not be able to perceive them because they're in another dimension, which is exactly what you find with the nature of angels and demons, etc. And Jacques Vallée finally asks the question. In his book, Messengers of Deception, page 8, why is it, I wondered, that the occupants of UFOs seemed or behaved so much like the denizens of fairy tales and the elves of ancient folklore? Why is the picture we can form of their world so much closer to the medieval concept of Magonia, the magical land above the clouds, than to a description of an extraterrestrial planetary environment? And why are UFOs becoming a new religious form? UFOs are a huge religious form today, folks. We have many people today here in Roswell, New Mexico that are hoping that ET will make contact and are ready to worship ET. We saw in the movie Independence Day, the people standing on top of the building in LA, take me, beam me up, Scotty, huh? <laughs> on January 6th, 1997, an Israeli psychic announced to her followers that, that UFOs, that aliens were gonna make contact in Israel, uh, I believe um, near Haifa or Tel Aviv, one or the other, and she encouraged her followers to come out at night. And they came out, thousands of people, it was reported in the news, stood and waited all night for E.T. to come down. They had placards, and they were in Hebrew, you know, take me home, you know, beam me up, you know. And they stood out there all night waiting to receive these entities. They never came. A plane flew over at one point. When they saw the lights, people started getting worked up into a frenzy. When they realized it was just a plane, they started crying. But the point is... <laughs> People are willing to and excited about meeting these ETs. They're viewed as our saviors. They've fixed, they have solved, they have conquered the kinds of problems that mankind has faced. And if we could only get their knowledge, they could save us from our predicaments. And Jacques Vallée has indeed asked the question, why is it that UFOs are becoming a new religious form? 